Okay, this is Sensation and Perception, Chapter 1. What is perception? Sensation and perception apply to many different areas of psychology. Sensation and perception are part of the psychology curriculum because the goal of this field is to understand perceptual experience, which is all about how our brains make sense of the sensory world around us. Understanding how our minds interpret the world around us is an inherently psychological goal. Psychological processes like attention, intention, emotion, and biases all influence the ways in which we perceive the world. An example of this is the sensory experience of pain. A marathon runner may be in immense pain and discomfort after crossing the finish line, but they may also be very happy to have completed the marathon. In this case, the pain is interpreted in the context of completing an objective. However, these same physical conditions could be interpreted as torture under different circumstances. TLDR, pain involves both sensory and emotional qualities. So even in states of exhaustion and pain, people can still feel euphoric. Visual displays and illusions are other examples where we can apply principles of sensation and perception. Illusions provide examples where the physical object can be perceived in more than one way, even when the object stays the same. Personal biases influence perception. Designing and understanding signs is a more applied area of sensation and perception. To quickly convey the meaning of something, visuals that cue a person into what they should expect are valuable in the real world. Some information from the lecture now. Knowledge of sensation and perception has led to many practical applications that have improved people's lives. For example, thanks to sensation and perception, we have an intervention for amblyopia, or lazy eye. The treatment involves putting an eye patch over the person's good eye so that they are forced to only use their lazy eye. Eventually, the lazy eye will be forced to pick up the slack and return to normal. Sensation and perception also improves technology, and this ties into the idea of human factors that we'll discuss later. Good human factors have improved lots of aspects of modern life, like giving us touch screens that put the world right at our fingertips. We interact with technology in more intuitive ways that are great for how humans sense and perceive the world. Lastly, sensation and perception deepens our aesthetic experiences. So just think of things like the taste of food, the quality of art, or the magnificence of nature. You experience all of this because of sensation and perception. Of course, our senses have been designed to work well and to be effective. For that reason, we do not need to think about our sensations or our perceptions. We are kind of on autopilot. We don't often think about how amazing these sensations and these perceptions really are. We have more than just the traditional five senses. Yes, more than just taste, touch, sight, smell, and hearing. For example, in addition to these sensory systems, we have a vestibular system to help keep our balance and a proprioception system that allows us to monitor the position of our bodies. Our sense of touch is composed of multiple physiological systems designed to sense different features of the environment. Heat, cold, pain, itchiness, and soft touch are all implemented by separable systems. Fun fact. The receptors for the itch experience are a unique kind of receptor, different from those that sense touch and those that sense pain. So depending on how the different touch systems are counted, it is more realistic to say that humans have anywhere from 7 to 12 different sensory systems. Also, remember that interoception refers to the internal sensations we have, like hunger and, well, other bodily sensations. The most basic concepts in sensation and perception are stimulus, sensation, and perception. A stimulus is an element of the world around us that affects our sensory systems. Sensation is the registration of physical stimuli on sensory receptors, and perception is the process of creating conscious perceptual experience from sensory input. Sensation is all about how the body biologically responds to stimuli. To this point, just think of the rods and cones of the eye that help us see the world. On the flip side, perception involves turning the sensory input into meaningful 
conscious experience. With perception, ask yourself, what do I see? How would I describe it? Altogether, a stimulus triggers some sensation, and that neural signal is then translated into usable information by our perception. Pulling from the PowerPoint, perception is your conscious interpretation. The stimulus is more objective and starts with the object or pattern itself. When it comes to vision, patterns will emit or reflect light, which is the stimulus for vision. Light waves then enter the eye and stimulate cells in the retina, specifically the rods and the cones. The rods and cones of the visual system sense the light energy. This is what we mean by sensation. Sometimes we confuse sensation with perception, and there can be some overlap. But when we think about perception, the end result is what we consciously see. Perception involves a longer sequence of events that involve many different regions of the brain, including areas of the cerebral cortex. So the whole process goes stimulus, sensation, perception. Cool. Cognitive processes aid in understanding what it is you are looking at. For example, without the cultural knowledge of what a Russian doll looks like, the colorful wooden figures would not make much sense to you. Perception requires that biological receptors receive energy from the environment. So, let's break down some terms. Transduction is the process of converting a physical stimulus into an electrochemical signal. Receptors are specialized sensory neurons that convert physical stimuli into neural responses. And a neural response is the signal produced by receptor cells that can then be sent to the brain. Sensation refers to the process of transduction, in which receptors convert physical signals into neural responses. On the other hand, perception refers to the process of taking that signal and processing it into a usable image or experience. For example, when we listen to music, the hair cells in our cochlear convert the sound waves into neural signals, but it is our brains that convert the neural signals into the experience of the music that we hear. The perceptual process also includes acting upon stimuli. Action is simply any motor activity. Yes, any movement that we make can qualify as action. One of the goals of perception is to support successful action. Actions vary by organism, as the actions of a human are very different from the actions of a bird. Fun fact, if movement is directed by something we perceive in the environment, then we can see that it is perception-guided action. Also, a quick note about the theory of anactivism and embodied cognition. These ideas suggest that perception and action are the foundation for higher level thought. When it comes to embodied cognition, our thinking is said to be informed by our bodies. So there are educational implications to this. Just think of hands-on learning when it comes to tasks like building a car. Putting our bodies into it helps us understand what we're doing. TLDR, the process of movement, or action, is important for perception. Part of perception involves phenomenology, and it is one of the biggest mysteries of all. Phenomenology refers to our internal experience of the world around us, our subjective experience of perception. An example of phenomenology. When we see a beautiful sunset, we notice the colors and the landscape. The experience of all this is considered its phenomenology. Issues of phenomenology interest psychologists and philosophers alike. Phenomenology includes our conscious emotional experiences that can result when we perceive things like a particular scene or even a tasty meal. Of course, phenomenology is subjective as it is bound to first-person POV. Phenomenology remains a big scientific mystery because it is a private experience. Now let's talk history. Illusions have been intellectual curiosities for centuries, definitely predating the formal science of psychology. A lengthy example of this is the Aristotle illusion, discovered by the Greek philosopher Aristotle a few thousand years ago. Place the tip of a pencil in between your crossed index and middle finger. If you place the tip in just the right position, you should experience two points instead of just one. The explanation is that the stimulation confuses us because it is touching the outside of the middle finger and the inside of the index finger. Under usual circumstances, such a situation would result if two separate points were stimulating the skin. 
A simpler illusion is a motion after effect, which is just a sensory experience that occurs after prolonged experience of visual motion in one particular direction. Fun fact, biologist Jonas Mueller developed the doctrine of the specific nerve energies. The doctrine of the specific nerve energies is the argument that it is the specific neurons activated that determine the particular type of experience. Theories of color vision are another early area within sensation and perception. Here we talk about Helmholtz versus Herring. These guys came up with two different ideas of how we see color, and it turns out that each one was a little bit right. Helmholtz thought of our color vision as being based on the perception of three primary colors red, green, and blue. Yes, Helmholtz came up with the trichromatic theory of color vision. Helmholtz was partly right with his approach because his theory coincides with what happens with the three cone types in the retina, as each cone in the retina has a preference for certain wavelengths. On the flip side, Herring developed the opponent process theory of color vision. Herring saw color vision as being based on color opponency, he saw two major pairs of color opponents, green-red and blue-yellow. Again, modern research suggests that both Helmholtz and Herring were correct to some extent. Trichromacy from Helmholtz best explains the workings of the retina, whereas opponency from Herring accounts for how areas of the visual brain, or occipital cortex, treat color. Helmholtz explains work in the retina, whereas Herring explains work beyond the retina. Helmholtz and Herring were involved in a debate that is still going on to this day. Helmholtz championed unconscious inference and constructivism, whereas Herring was all about direct perception. Focusing first on Helmholtz, he said that because our senses do not produce sufficient information about the world, we must use a form of reason, unconsciously, to make an educated guess about what we actually perceive. This is an unconscious inference. In other words, Helmholtz's unconscious inference idea is all about how perception is not adequately determined by sensory information. So, an inference, or educated guess, is part of the process. This inference is not the result of active problem solving, but rather a result of a non-conscious cognitive process. Also, the constructive approach from Helmholtz is the idea that perceptions are constructed using information from our senses and cognitive processes. In this way, the sensory signal needs to be interpreted by active cognitive processes. Herring would throw hands over this, presenting instead the idea of direct perception. Herring argued that stimuli themselves had sufficient information to allow for direct perception. Herring viewed environmental inputs and our sensory apparatus as sufficient enough for us to grasp the structure of the perceived world without the need for internal, unconscious inferences. That is, stimuli themselves contain adequate information for the viewer to perceive the world. In Herring's view, the perceptual processes in the brain do not need to make sense of the perceptual world. The brain simply needs to register it. TLDR, direct perception, says that sensory input is often sufficient. Fun fact, Helmholtz's view is more popular with experimental psychologists as well as physiologists, whereas Herring's view influenced gestalt psychology, the Gibsonian view, or direct perception theory, and more recently, embodied cognition theory. Moving right along, talking about Weber, Fechner, and the birth of psychophysics. Weber's law states that a just noticeable difference, or JND, between two stimuli is related to the magnitude or strength of the stimuli. Weber's law concerns the perception of difference between two stimuli. For example, we can easily detect when a candle has been lit in a dark room, but in a room with 100 candles already lit up, we may not notice the light from just one more candle. Fechner is considered the father of psychophysics. His landmark work on the relation between physical stimuli and perception established sensory psychology as a unique discipline, separate from physiology. His work inspired the beginning of scientific psychology. Psychophysics is the study of the relation between physical stimuli and 
perception events. And yes, Fechner developed psychophysics long before psychology was considered an official science. This all leads us to the 20th century and the study of perception. Cognitive psychology approaches. Gestalt psychology is a school of thought claiming that we view the world in terms of general patterns and well-organized structures rather than separate individual elements. Gestalt is the concept of whole or form. It is the view that what we perceive is not individual elements, but rather fairly organized wholes or forms. Gestalt is influential in the field of object perception. Gestalt psychologists considered the visual perception of edges as critical to determining what objects are. They identified several situations in which we see illusory edges on the basis of Gestalt principles, like the Kanitsa Triangle. In the Kanitsa Triangle, we see illusory contours, which are suggested by the overall pattern of the figure, but are not physically there. Note, Gestalt is not a person. The term translates from German as whole or form. And then there is direct perception, or the Gibsonian approach. The approach to perception that claims that information in the sensory world is complex and abundant, and therefore the perceptual systems only need to directly perceive such complexity. In the direct perception view, the senses do not send incomplete or inaccurate information about the world to the brain that then needs to be reasoned with to generate a perception. No. Good examples are things like driving, landing an airplane, and playing sports or video games. The direct perception view also emphasized ecological realism in experiments. This just means that rather than showing simple displays to participants in experiments, direct perception theorists advocated using more naturalistic stimuli. For this reason, the direct perception view is often called the ecological approach to perception. Okay, we're almost done. Steady on. The information processing approach is the idea that perceptual and cognitive systems can be viewed as the flow of information from one process to another. Think of how this is used in everyday language when we are exposed to lots of information. We need time to make sense of it all. Information is collected by sensory processes and then flows to a variety of modules that decode the information, interpret it, and then allow the organism to act on it. Historically, the information processing theory came about based on the computer metaphor, which takes us from input to the processing of symbols, and finally to output. While overly simplistic, it did help in isolating the different stages that information goes through, from sensing to perceiving to responding, and it was also helpful in determining the time course for various levels of processing. For example, how long does it take after an image is flashed on a screen before we can identify it? Fast, yes, but not instantaneous. And this is where the information processing theory comes in. The information processing approach provides a critique of behaviorist views, as information processing in this case is just the internal transformation of symbols, like perception memory. Information processing models specify the stages that sensory and cognitive information flow through. Think of the three-box memory model from general psychology. It goes from sensory memory, to short-term memory, to long-term memory. The information processing approach is interdisciplinary in nature, meaning that psychologists and computer scientists alike can use it. A psychologist may use it to understand what goes on in the mind, while a computer scientist can use it to build an artificial mind like Siri. TLDR, with information processing models, we try to understand perception in terms of the various processes involved, basically looking at the series of steps involved in processing something. Also, when it comes to memory, we think of there being separate memory types because some memories are fleeting. Computational approaches are similar to information processing, just more mathematical. Basically, the computational approach is an approach to the study of perception in which the necessary computations the brain would need to carry out to perceive the world are specified. Computational approaches build on the information processing approach, but they acknowledge that many perceptual processes may occur side by side in the brain. Computational approaches help us understand the processes behind our understanding of the world. They model what the brain is doing. 
The computational approach goes deeper into the information processing model in order to identify specific processes that can be implemented mathematically in an algorithm to solve particular perceptual and cognitive problems. We see a lot of this in technology today, from robots that can navigate a room, recognize face or voice, etc. Also, mathematical models are based on neural networks and computer simulations of how nervous systems actually work. TLDR, the basics of computational approaches are that they are similar to information processing approaches, only computational approaches try to uncover what is going on, make it more precise, and make it more formal. So just think of computer science stuff. Neuroscience methods provide a nice blending of psychology and biology. Neuroscience is the study of the structures and processes in the nervous system and the brain. Neuroscience is interested in the cellular level, necessary to understand how individual neurons convert physical stimuli into electrochemical signals. To this point, think of the microelectrode. A microelectrode is a device so small that it can penetrate a single neuron in the mammalian central nervous system without destroying the cell. This was a very important development in neuroscience. Once it is in the cell, the microelectrode can record the electrical activity or even stimulate the cell by carrying the electrical current to the cell from an electrical source at the command of the scientist. So we can use microelectrodes to understand how neurons work. But they are controversial, as we do have things like ethical concerns to account for. Fun fact, though. People may sometimes partake in research with microelectrodes because, well, a human undergoing brain surgery could contribute to science by volunteering for a microelectrode procedure. Another method often used in neuroscience is functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. This is a neuroimaging technique that generates an image of the brain on the basis of the blood levels in different areas of the brain, which correlate with activity levels in those regions. fMRI allows us to indirectly determine the activity of the brain. fMRI is also less invasive than the microelectrode, so it is less controversial and it can be used on animals. When using an fMRI, we are looking at an indirect measure of brain activity. fMRI picks up the magnetic charge of blood as that charge changes in accordance with blood flow. If a lot of activity is popping off in one area of the brain, blood will rush to it, and that will then cue scientists into the fact that something is important about that area of the brain. Something important is happening in that area of the brain. Fun fact. Human neurons and animal neurons are pretty similar. Also, from the textbook, neuroimaging involves technologies that allow us to map living, intact brains as they engage in ongoing tasks, like fMRI. Neuroscience methods provide a nice blending of psychology and biology. Pulling from the textbook, neuropsychology is the study of the relation of brain damage to changes in behavior. Agnosia is a deficit in some aspect of perception as a result of brain damage. And now that term will be relevant very soon. Many disorders have a neurological or perceptual basis. A prime example is autism. As another example, prosopagnosia is face agnosia, which results in a deficit in perceiving faces. This is a disorder where an individual has difficulty recognizing familiar faces even one's own family members. Some cases are congenital, meaning that they are present from birth, while other cases can result from injury or stroke. People can also experience prosopagnosia differently. Some can describe faces, but they cannot make connections, while other people may just see a blur. Yet another example of a disorder with a neurological or perceptual basis is amusia, which is a condition in which brain damage interferes with the perception of music, but does not interfere with other aspects of auditory processing. People with amusia cannot recognize music. They may hear sound, but they do not detect anything musical or rhythmic. Finally, let's explore cognitive 
penetration. Cognitive penetration is the view that cognitive and emotional factors influence the phenomenology of perception. Cognitive penetration means that non-perceptual factors affect what we see, hear, taste, and feel. It's all about how we are influenced by the way we see the world. As an example, let's say that apples are usually red and bells are usually not red. According to cognitive penetration, then, a red apple, which again is usually red, may be seen as more red than a red bell because we expect to see red when looking at the apple, but we do not expect to see red when looking at the bell. The placebo effect is another example of cognitive penetration because placebos are tied to belief or expectation. Remember, though, placebos are shams, farces, fake treatments. The opposite of cognitive penetration is cognitive impenetrability, which states that perception is not affected by cognitive factors, only our reporting of them is. Impenetrability implies that our perception remains the same, regardless of our cognitive and emotional state. What changes instead is attention, expectation, or our mood state, which is different from our perceptual state. To this point, illusions suggest that our knowledge of what is happening right in front of us does not affect the way we perceive it or experience it. For example, consider the muller liar illusion, or the illusion of length. Even knowing that the lines are the same length does not alter the way that we perceive the lengths of the lines. Fun fact, the dominant view in this field is that perception is cognitively impenetrable. Finally, some concluding notes. A contemporary application of perception is with traffic safety and aircraft safety. Remember, looming impacts driving. It is based on visual cues as it indicates when we might make contact with some object. Time to collision is the estimate of the time it will take for an approaching object to make contact with another object. Also, the size arrival effect is all about how bigger approaching objects are seen as being more likely to collide with the viewer than smaller approaching objects. With all this in mind, collision research concerns the visual perception of imminent collisions. People use both the rates of expansion of approaching objects and the sizes of those objects to estimate time to collision. A not so fun fact here is that the use of the sizes of objects to estimate time to collision often results in errors, in that smaller objects are judged to impact much later than they actually do. These concepts are relevant for human factors, also known as engineering psychology. Human factors are concerned with the application of what we know about people, their abilities, characteristics, and limitations to the design of the equipment that they use, the environments in which they function, and the jobs that they perform. In other words, human factors is just an area of applied psychology that tries to make the world safer for humans. Drivers and pilots alike must account for time to collision and the size arrival effect. Automation does help in this area, as airplanes especially have lots of automation that help the plane get to and from destinations safely. Okay, that is going to do it for Sensation and Perception, Chapter 1.